Hello, my name is Gary Davis, and this video is being made exclusively for Autodesk Area and SIGGRAPH 2011. Today I'm going to be taking a look at Autodesk 3ds Max and Smoke, and some of the newer features in the 2012 release, as well as the subscription advantage packs. In this first portion of the video, we're going to take a look at a nice broadcast design piece from our friends at WBZ, which is a CBS affiliate out of Boston. And here you can see we've got a nice uh, broadcast design piece. In fact, it's got, you know, beveled text. We've got some logos flying around, nice motion graphics in the back plate and so on. So we've got what we're going to do is set up this scene to do render passes and we're going to take advantage of a new feature in the subscription advantage pack for 3ds Max 2012 called state sets. So if I dismiss the dialog and jump over into 3ds Max, here you can see we've got our scene set up and it's pretty much ready to go for rendering. So what I'm going to do, I'm only going to render a still for demonstration purposes, but this is obviously going to work for animation as well. If I bring up our render dialog, you can see that we're set up here actually currently to use the scanline renderer. And then ahead of time, I've set up some render elements as you often would do to separate things like shadow and specular and Z depth and so on. So what I've done, uh, one more additional step that might be uh, not quite normal to uh, previous workflows is that while the elements are active, I've actually turned them all off. So I could just select them and turn them all on and off here. They're off in what I like to consider sort of this base state. And what I mean by states is, and to open up the render dialog and show our new feature called state sets, what you've got here is the ability to basically layer up changes to this base state, which I you know, consider sort of your, your max scene. So we've set up things like the renderer and, and what resolution we're going to go out and so on. But what we can then do is come into this state right here. In this first state, I might call it main. And in this main state, what I want to do is record, or render out rather, our render elements. So if I hit this record button right here, when this little red dot is enabled, we're basically recording changes to anything in our scene, including things like object visibility, if it's hidden or not, uh, material assignment, whether lights are turned on or off. So in this case, in this main state, all I'm going to do is come over to the render dialog, select all of these, and turn them on, and then stop recording. And if I disable that state, now that's finished. And I've basically recorded a setup for our primary output, which I've called main, and that's going to render our render elements. Well, then what I can quickly do is say, let's go ahead and add another state, and I'm going to rename this AO for ambient occlusion. And interestingly enough, and one of the most powerful features of state sets, is that you can use different renderers for all of these different states. And that includes third party renderers such as V-Ray, Final Render, and Brazil, and so on. So that's going to be a really powerful feature. And one other feature just to mention is that these state sets in this example that I'm using, are I'm using them for different render passes. But if you're a modeler, for example, at a game company and not doing a lot of rendering, these can be useful for doing things like hiding and unhiding different scenes, state sets of things like when your bone rig is showing or when your geometry is hidden or frozen and, and so on. So back to the action. And what I'm going to do here is record hit record and create an ambient occlusion state. So now I'm going to record changes to this base state. And the first and most important one to do ambient occlusion is I'm going to switch out to our mental ray rendering engine. And I'm going to do some things like turning off final gather. Uh, for ambient occlusion, I don't really need our environment map backplate here. So I just want a pure white background. What I could also do is go into the processing tab, bring up our material editor. And I've already ahead of time set up a uh, quick drag and drop ambient occlusion shader for our material override. So I can just drag and drop that in there. And we've got our ambient occlusion all set up. And interestingly enough, I can also do test renders while I'm recording. So if I just say, let's see what that's going to look like. We've got our nice ambient occlusion pass. That's going to be good. It looks perfect. Good enough for uh, demonstration purposes anyway. And then I'll go ahead and say stop recording. So now what I can do is exit out of that state and I've set it up so that I have metal ray to render my ambient occlusion and I have a scanline renderer including render elements with our main output. So now what I can do is come up onto our states dialog and say I want to do our render outputs and this is where I could define a different path if I wanted to in different file formats for each of these states. I'll go ahead and set that path and then what I'm going to do is simply right click and say render all states. 
So as expected, you can see it's going to first do our mental ray ambient occlusion pass. Then it's going to quickly switch renderers to our scanline renderer, which you can see the active state right now is our main state. And uh, it's going to you know, rip through this good old scanline renderer. Still comes in handy for a lot of things, including broadcast graphics and motion graphics. And as expected, as this thing renders through and finishes our frame, you're going to see all the render elements pop up. So what we've got here is our Z-depth pass and our specular pass and all the other render elements that we would expect to uh, come out of that render dialog setup. So to take this one step further, what I can do is bring over our composite view. And in our composite view, I could say, let's bring up the render composite view for just these two state sets, or I could bring up a composite view for render elements, which is what I want to do in this particular case. So as this uh, goes out and searches our hard drive, and actually what you can do is see out here, it created a directory for all of our different passes. Here's our ambient occlusion pass, and there's our single file that we rendered out. And then if I look at the directory called main, here is in fact all of the render elements that we put out. So here you can see I've got a node in here. Let me just go full screen and I'll right click and say zoom extents. Uh, let me unselect that and do a zoom extents. So here is our main output, which is our state set for main. And there's all of the render elements that are associated with that set. Here's a second state set for ambient occlusion and it only has one output. So if I double click on this, another interesting feature here is that you can either work with this um, as uh, let me get uh, over here for some screen real estate and I can use this uh, navigator here I can also use my standard max hotkeys for navigation in here now I've got this composite node or if I double click on it I can actually get access to a composite map type here and while we're over in the material editor here this is really just another way of viewing how we would do a pre-comp and in this case what we're going to do is output this to Adobe After Effects so what I could do here is set it up, and in, in the case of our ambient occlusion, we might want to set that uh, transfer mode to multiply. And again, I could do that in either place. I could do it here in our uh, state set composite view, or I can do it over here in the composite uh, map type. And again, just to re immediately reiterate, even though we're using the material editor composite map type, this is really just an interface to set up the pre-comp for your compositing application. So I won't go through all of these. I could definitely set these up uh, you know, inside of 3ds Max as we could do here. But what I can quickly do is say, let's go to our compositor and create a composite link. So down here is our composite link uh, output. And we can say, what file do we want to create? Well, let's go ahead and create on the root of this drive. And let's call it SIGGRAPH. Uh, probably spelled wrong. Nope, I get, did get the spelling right. And let's save that out. So now what I could do is jump into After Effects. And if I just launch After Effects, what I can do then is link to this SOF file that 3ds Max created. So up comes After Effects. And all I'm going to do I, ahead of time, by the way, uh, I did install a plugin to After Effects that comes with the subscription advantage pack release of 3ds Max. And that's a mouthful to say. But what we've done is taken a plugin for After Effects that will be provided with the extension release. And then After Effects has then the ability to link back to the 3ds Max file. So what we can do here, let's close out that and say, open our composite link using the Autodesk link. And I'm going to go create a link back to our SIGGRAPH. And when I do that, up comes our uh, composite link settings. This is a live link, by the way, back to that file. And if I just quickly double click, you can see that a lot of information came across here. We have a pre-comp already made, and we've got our ambient occlusion with our multiply transfer mode. And here's all of our render passes. So this is just a great way to get assets to and from 3ds Max using uh, this uh, live link to Compositor. And in this case, for obvious advantage, uh, there's a lot of Adobe After Effects users out there using 3ds Max. And this is going to be a nice way to get uh, information back and forth between the two packages. In this part of the video, I'm going to take a look at state sets as well. And I'd like to thank our friends across the pond at Arc New Media House for providing this file. Here you can see we have a pretty straightforward scene. It's a static scene, but we've got four different cameras that I've animated inside of the scene. Now in this case, our render elements once again are already set up. If I look at our render elements, we're using the Metal Ray Renderer. 
um, but not really pertinent so much in this case about the render elements as it is these multiple cameras. So once again, I'm going to evoke our state sets dialog. And in this case, what I'm going to want to do is render out these four cameras as render elements. So interestingly enough, I could just say, let's go ahead and create a new state set. And this state set is going to be cam A. Now I've named our cameras accordingly ahead of time and that's okay. But what I can do is very simply easily say, let's record this state change. I'm going to switch into camera A. And then I'm going to save that file using a specific output type called camera A. I'll stop recording and then continue the process and say for this one, let's go camera B, record, switch out to our camera B, change the output type, or rather, sorry, not the output type, but the name and say camera B, if I could type, <laughs> camera B, and so on. So what you're going to be able to do is very quickly pop between camera A camera B and then ultimately when I render these out by just saying right click and render this render the states is that we're going to get cameras A, B, C and D as render elements and this is going to be another neat way to use state sets uh, within 3ds Max 2012. Another interesting use of state sets has nothing to do with rendering and that's actually to just control your viewport uh, layout. Here you can see, uh, and it wouldn't be a SIGGRAPH demo or a 3DS Max demo without our good friend the teapot here, but I basically just got a perspective viewport set up, uh, currently using our new uh, viewport type of acrylic, but that's uh, just to kind of feature that for no particular reason. What I'm going to do is set up a, a state set here, and in this case, I'm going to rename this one 4up. Now for 4up, I can just go ahead and record, and then what I could do is record the changes of our viewport configuration. So I can just say, let's have four views, and in this view is our camera, maybe our front, top view, and we've got our left view, and we go ahead and apply that. And I can even do things like change this to wireframe, and so we're all set up there, and I'll stop the recording. Now what I could do is when I disable this 4up, state set you can see that I jump back to our one view well I can do that for as many of these viewport configurations as I want and this has nothing to do with rendering whatsoever so this is going to be something for the modelers out there or the animators or anybody um, here I could make a new state and call this anim so for animation I might want to say let's record this change and do our viewport uh, configuration something like this where I have a camera view down here that's nice and wide or anamorphic and then once again, I could say uh, top view, front view, and left view to kind of round out that. And once again, maybe just I want, whoops, let's close that. Once again, I want wireframe in our top view. Uh, let's hotkey that. And then for whatever reason, I could say for this particular view, I might want something like hidden line. And in this view, we want realistic. What, however you want to set these up. And then once I stop recording, I can now very easily flip-flop between our four up view, our base uh, state of one up view, or our four up view with a nice wide anamorphic viewport. So again, that's just a real quick look at another use of these state sets. It has nothing to do with rendering, and this is just going to be something that impacts every single user out there. Um, just we've really just uh, hit the tip of the iceberg here with these state set videos uh, for the area and SIGGRAPH. You can have nested state sets, all kinds of good stuff. So look for more videos on state sets coming in, in, the, in the coming months. And with that, I'm going to segue over into Autodesk Smoke to talk about ways that you can work with uh, 3D rendered um, elements from applications such as 3ds Max. Okay, here. so here I am over in Autodesk Smoke 2012, and you can see that I've got my clips loaded up from our good friends over at Arc Media. If you notice here, I've got shots A, B, C, and D from our Max renders using state sets, as well as some uh, render passes like our ambient occlusion, here's a matte pass, and then here's another matte pass that I did for the uh, ground or the ice. Uh, to take a look at some of these clips, I'm just going to hit the control escape key to go full screen. And here you can see that I've got these clips rendered out. I used uh, one of my old favorite techniques of use, doing non-photorealism or cartoon rendering uh, using the metal ray renderer, ink and paint shader, and it also has some substance textures and ambient occlusion within the shader. So that's how I got this look here. But I just want to go through some of these shots and kind of just quickly show you what we've got to work with here. So I've got a, a nice panning close-up shot there. 
if we look at this shot, it's sort of our establishing shot to kind of come down in on these little uh, pods, these Antarctic pods or whatever you want to call these. And then here's another revealing shot that just kind of pans up. So one of the great things about smoke is that in addition to being a editorial tool or a storytelling tool, it also has a lot of powerful compositing features. So whereas you might want to go back and forth between a nonlinear editing application and a compositing application in many different workflows, Smoke is going to allow you to do a lot of those tasks, if not all of those tasks, in one environment. And that's one of the benefits of using an application such as Autodesk Smoke. Now I already brought these in, but just to show you, if I browse out to my library, here's all my render passes, and I've got, I actually did more render passes uh, out of 3ds Max for this uh, project, but I'm only going to really be taking advantage of some of these, and I but I just wanted to show you uh, some of the neat things in here. I can swipe over and I have a player with all of the metadata that's associated with this image sequence. In this case, these are uh, PNG image sequences, but we can certainly read you know, lots of different file formats, including OpenEXR, QuickTime files, Red3D, and so on. I'm going to stick to kind of being, thinking like a 3D animator here and get back to my desktop. So this is home base where we have our desktop tools. And what we can start to do is even rearrange these in a certain order visually here to kind of think in terms of storytelling or editorially that way. Or I can just hold the F key down and I'm going to just copy these down and create a new timeline down here. So I've got my camera A. I'm going to get, whoops, let me do that again. F copy camera shot B. Get shot C. I could do this with hotkeys, but I'm doing it manually to see, so you, you can see me kind of doing the drag and drop process here. Um, so what we've got, oops, let me undo that. Let me just drag this over. So here you can see our timeline. And another thing that Smoke has, in addition to Flame, it's uh, sort of sibling, is this a lot of gestural tools. I'm using a Wacom uh, Cintiq right now, and I'm just kind of hammering over to the right of the screen. That's how I'm flip-flopping between the uh, desktop tools and actually the timeline. So here you can see our uh, editorial timeline. If I go back to the beginning and just kind of scrub through this, you can see our shots one, two, three, and four. And another way to look at this is by holding down or tapping the F5 key, and I can get to more of a traditional sort of nonlinear editing workflow this way. I can see that I had some head and tail frames. I want to actually stretch this out and not have our head and tail frames. I just want to have be working with our full clips here. Uh, and that was my fault ahead of time. So now let's uh, look at this. So I'm checking my heads and tails. I've got all the clips at full duration. So now again, we can start before we start to do our compositing functions in the timeline. We can actually think about this more in terms of a nonlinear editor and a storyteller. You know, looking at these shots, what's going to make the most sense, or what's going to be, uh, you know, impact or dramatic, or have the most impact rather. So what we could do is say, you know, looking at these shots, I've got this establishing shot D down here, and it's kind of like a nice reveal. And I don't want to save that to the end. It's kind of, you know, what's going on there? I don't really know what that is. Let's get that up front so it's a nice sort of mysterious reveal. Now what I can do is I've got my timeline editorial set up right here to snap to positioner. You can snap to a lot of different things, but the positioner is this yellow cursor that I'm dragging around. And I can hotkey back and forth between my edits using uh, hotkeys on the keyboard. I'm using the Z and X key to get back and forth between transitions. So what I could do is put that positioner right at the beginning of my clip, and then with a quick gesture, I can just grab this D clip and drag and drop it over here. So now, you know, pretty basic nonlinear editing function, but that's the point, is that we have both nonlinear editing and compositing. So once again, for storytelling purposes, I might want to have this uh, secondary close-up shot in there second. So let's go back there drag and drop our B clip, put it second, and now we're going in out of order from our original intent of camera D, B, A, and C. So now we've got sort of this reveal and another reveal, you know, and you're not sure what that is. And then we've got this sort of establishing shot right there and then our, you know, real establishing shot at the end. So we've, we're, we're starting to like that editorially, and now we can think in terms of a compositor. Let's uh, go back to our desktop and start to think in terms of compositing. So just like you would do in, in a lot of other compositors, you can work with a layer-based workflow. What I can do over here in my timeline is just add another layer, and now I've got a secondary layer that's empty up here. And once again, I can just uh, use my hotkeys to start getting between these. Um, let me just reset all these. Uh, I'm just going through and setting the in and out points of these real quick. So what I can do is look and I've got shot D is first. So I'll, here's my A, B, C, D all nice and laid out for me. 
So what I can do is just come through and say, let's grab this one here, and I'll just tap the G key to insert that into my timeline. So you can see that it lays down right over top. And let's just continue to do that. So we've got B right here. I'll hit the G key to insert that. Now A is next. And then lastly, we've got C, so A, B, C right here. So we've got our timeline laid out, and if we watch this, now you can see that our ambient occlusion is in fact overlaid, but now we want to do more compositing functions. So we are, you know, stacking things up on top of one another at this point, but now we need to do some things like take advantage of our blending modes or transfer modes. So what we've got over here on the left of our timeline are uh, several different tools that we can apply, and these are called soft effects. These can be added to any clip in the timeline so that you've got you know, an editorial timeline as you're working you know, laterally, but then you can apply effects, if, if you will, to these different uh, clips. Now the one that I'm gonna take advantage of here first is a thing called Axis, and this button comes on, which means the Animate button is enabled, and I can do things like um, you know, position and rotation and so on, and do uh, repositions and things like that in here, but that's not what I'm gonna really be after in this, in this case. What I'm gonna be after is Transfer Modes, which you can get right here. So here's my Blend, and I wanna change this to a Multiply, and you can see that our uh, clip is gonna change out Oops, let me go back in and edit that. So we've got our, uh, and now I'm actually, let me backpedal here. What I just did was actually went into this E button. So I've got the axis effect selected and enabled. And what I can do here is change the transfer modes kind of out on the desktop. So you can see that I've got, um, here's a before and after our ambient occlusion. Right now what I'm doing actually is hotkeying my up and down arrows to change this horizontal little tab right here so right now I'm looking at the composite with two layers right now I'm looking at the base layer so I'm just using the up and down arrows to look at a before and after of my comp here so there I've got my composite uh, nice and uh, happening in there one thing I'm noticing is that our sky is actually being knocked out and the reason for that is that if you look at our ambient occlusion it has a black uh, outline there well what we can do is use the alpha channel or the mat that was rendered out of 3ds max for that so if I swipe back over, let's take a look. What I can do then is take advantage of something called a matte container. So likewise, and this happens also in the axis tool, what I can do is say that this particular layer is gonna have a matte. Now just make a mental note that it's layered or camera D. I can say, what is the matte for D? And it's A, B, C, D. Oops, it's right here. So I'll just pick that, go back, and now you can see that we've got our nice ambient occlusion comped over our um, cartoon render with our nice background over there. So now it's just a matter of coming through very easily and saying B has an axis effect, it has a blending mode of multiply, and it's gonna have a mat of B alpha channel. So we do that. Once again, we can come through here, look at A. It's gonna have an axis effect, blending mode or transfer mode of multiply for our ambient occlusion. And then it has a mat or a mat container in smoke speak. And let me see A is right there and we've got that all set up and then lastly C axis transfer mode and matte container of C A B C right there so now we've got our clips you know end to end in a nice editorial timeline and we're doing compositing functions on these just to remind you out at the desktop I, for time's sake I won't show this but I have different tools in here to do things like color corrections to just the uh, ground and so on. So you, you have a lot of ability to just keep adding up layers here by clicking this layer button and continuing up this uh, composite, if you will, right in our timeline. So we're doing editorial and compositing in one. Now another thing that I could do here is to start treating this more like a, a single uh, timeline, more in, in back to thinking in terms of editing. And what I could do is say, I like this composite of the shot D here. What I want to do is contain those or nest these. You could almost think of this as like a nested composite in a lot of other applications might call this a nest. In smoke, what we're doing is going to contain it. So by clicking this button, you can see that I've got one clip there and it changed color. And you know, nothing changed about this clip. Here it is. It's our composite. And I can just do that to these, the rest of these. So very quickly, I could just say, let's contain that, let's contain that, let's contain that, and let's contain that. So we've got our nested comps end to end in our timeline. And then what we might do is start to continue to think, you know, editorially, as I look at this shot, this last one, 
it's kind of coming in uh, here, but if I actually reverse this clip, it might be a little more impactful as an ending shot to establish, or, you know, to end on this nice high shot, wide shot of our entire um, setup here in Antarctica. So I could just take this clip and once again, I can do a soft effect. I'll just say, I want to time warp this clip. Let's actually maybe even slow it down to say 75%. And I'm also going to uh, reverse that clip. So now we've got our clip. We've got some extra head frames or head and tail frames here. So I can make that clip a little bit longer. And I've also reversed it. So now we've got this nice ending shot that's going to really establish and, you know, really kind of bring things to an end here of our of our shot there. And then lastly, what we might want to do is just add some uh, transitions in here. So I can just bring in my positioner and just uh, easily create some head and tail frames here. And again, I could do this with hotkeys, but I'm just do using my tablet so you can kind of see a, a way to get started, you know, right away using smoke. And then editorially, I'm just adding some head and tail frames. And then once again, I could use my hotkeys to kind of pop between keyframes here. And then a nice little trick that uh, my good friend Dean Sherm showed me is that I can say, uh, let's just type in maybe and do a quick dissolve here. Oops, it could, wouldn't hurt to have a few more uh, tail frames on that one. That'll work. And so I see I've got 10 and 9, so maybe uh, let's say uh, 15 frame dissolve. So if I get to that clip, what I can do is type 15 and hit enter on the keyboard. And then I'm going to hit the end key, which is our dissolve hot. Uh, transition so you can see that that got added I'll jump to the next transition uh, maybe say 10 enter dissolve jump to our next transition oops and it looks like I need some out frames there jump to our next transition maybe this one's gonna be longer 20 frames and dissolve so now you can see once again we've got an editorial timeline and at this point what I could do optionally these dotted lines indicate that I have unprocessed uh, media one thing to mention that I maybe should have mentioned up front is that smoke is working completely uncompressed at this point. So this is pure 444 RGB uh, renders, and I did these uh, with high color bit depth. These are PNG files that are 16-bit uh, um, integer. And then what I could do is just tap this line right here to select my entire timeline and then go ahead and process this out. So that's going to be a look at uh, a way to you know bring in media from 3ds Max do both compositing and nonlinear editing functions at the same time within Smoke 2012. One last tool that I'd like to show you in this particular timeline is a, a feature called Gap Effects that Smoke has. And what we've got, and to remind you, we've got our editorial timeline of nested composites. We've got a time warped ending clip down there to uh, increase our you know drama or dramatic last shot. But then what we can do is take advantage of this empty layer up here. And to remind you, you could have as many of these as you want in your uh, timeline. But what I'm going to do is just undo that and get back to just this single empty gap right here. And what I can do, like we were applying these soft effects to individual clips in the timeline, I can also select an empty area such as the entire timeline and do something like a color corrector. Now I'm going to turn off the animate feature because I don't want to animate this color corrector over time. But what I can do is get to the basic color correction controls right here for things like saturation and maybe a hue shift if I want to just drop this into sort of cooler colors like that. But for more advanced controls, what I can do is tap this E button to go into our color correction module to do actual further manipulation. So maybe I want to darken this down a little bit using our gamma and maybe increase our contrast a little bit to just punch that up and drop our saturation down to maybe make it a little more sort of ice or wintry kind of cold feeling. So that's going to be good enough for now and I can load and save these color correction setups as uh, you'd expect. And if I exit out of the color correction tool now and scrub my timeline, you can see that I've done a color grade across all of these clips. So once again, we're doing editorial functions and compositing functions in our smoke timeline. And just to remind you here that this little uh, notch right here is called our focus. And I can use the down arrow to see our ungraded timeline right here. And then I could at any time just sim simply hit the up arrow to see our color graded version of it. So that's going to be one more step in the sort of hybrid compositing and editing functions of Smoke 2012. 
For the next portion of the video, I'm going to use some renders that I did. Uh, this is actually using a mechanical or mech model that Grant Warwick provides on the area. At, it's under Ken Pimentel's website, and there's a great review of 3ds Max 2012 there you can see. But what I can do is just show you sort of this editorial timeline. What we've got here is a beauty pass that I did. And again, I, I love this non-photorealistic kind of cartoon stuff. So this is our ink and paint version of our character. And then I've got a lighting pass that I did out of 3ds Max. I did a matte pass. I also have our good friend the ambient occlusion pass and our Z-depth or Z-depth pass since we're in uh, Vancouver this week for SIGGRAPH. So as you can see here, what I've done is rendered this out. And I also used uh, Louis Marcoux's script for doing stereoscopic rendering out of 3ds Max. So here you can see along the bottom we have our left eye. And on the top we have our right eye. So what I'm going to do here is actually just switch out. And I'll uh, jump into just a new timeline down here to create what's, what could be considered maybe a stereoscopic workflow. So what I can do here in addition to, uh, let me just show you back on a timeline here, in addition to these um, effects over here or soft effects that you apply in the timeline, what we also have the ability to do with, in Smoke is to do what are called desktop tools. So here I have access to lots of different desktop tools and I can go to a category of tools for doing stereo and here is where I can say I'm going to create a stereo track and it's prompting me to say select a left eye clip with the red arrow and a right eye clip with the blue arrow. So I can very easily just say this is left eye, right eye and then click on the desktop and this resulting clip is in fact a stereoscopic clip. So what if I, can, if I just drop that down in my timeline and now look at this in a player, what we can do is actually see that they, we've got our left and right eye acting as one single clip. And then what I can do one step further is to go into our viewer and choose different stereoscopic viewing modes for doing things like a horizontal split, a vertical split, or viewing it in stereo in any number of ways. So in this case, I might say, uh, here's our monoscopic clip, and let's go nice and full frame for that. And this would be where you could actually put on your uh, anaglyph red and blue glasses if you want to. And let me just zoom in there uh, just so you can see that a little bit better maybe on the internet. And what I can do is, once again, I can change the types of effects that that's going to be. Whoops, let me get back to my uh, full screen player here. And I could say maybe Dubois is the type of uh, anaglyph that I want to do. So again, I can go full screen and kind of see that effect taking place directly in real time and in the timeline of our viewer. So we're getting a great stereoscopic effect. And then to take that one step further, what I can do is actually come into our uh, stereoscopic tools for our axis effect. And instead of working on the surface, I can get to our stereo and actually adjust the convergence. So this might uh, start to hurt your eyes, but the point about editing stereo is, in fact, changing this convergence. So once again, I might want to go full screen and actually adjust this according to my uh, red and blue glasses. So I'm going to just put this back to a zero, assuming that we did it right out of our 3D application, and then come back and continue to work. So I could say, let's get back to our stereo tool set a stereo track and then go bang a or sorry left right enter stereo track left right enter stereo track left right enter stereo track left right and enter and now what we can do is just this timeline compositing effects just like we saw before but when i start to say uh you know let's add another layer you can see that it is in fact adding up two layers into our stereo effect so that's where i might say you know, let's go back to our first frame and once again I can start to use our hotkeys to just say let's insert this lighting pass into our timeline here and get our lighting pass and then maybe optionally do a uh, gap effect and load in a mat. So now we've got our lighting pass matted out over top of our character and it's using a stereoscopic timeline to do so. So that's just a quick way to do uh, stereoscopic merging and create an editorial timeline and composite timeline using stereoscopic renders from 3ds Max. A couple of other interesting tools that might uh, benefit 3D artists are found under Flame Effects and Flame Effects 2, which is part of the subscription advantage drop. So Flame Effects was new to the 2012 release, and Flame Effects 2 are a set of tools that are brand new that we're showing at SIGGRAPH for the first time. I'll start with Flame Effects, and if I jump into the desktop tool, there's one, you can see that there's quite a few in here. 
Uh, depth of field is going to be interesting to any 3D artist, and you can see that it's asking me for a front and a Z depth. So I've got those set up right here, and I can just say this is going to be our foreground. This is our Z depth or Z depth pass, and then where do we want to put the result on the desktop will be right there. So now we go into the tool. And you can see we've got controls for things like our depth of field effect or our bokeh effect and how that's going to sort of bloom in our view, number of slices and so on. So these kind of control the look and amount of the blur. And then right here we have our Z depth. Over, moving over to maybe the most important part of this is the depth o gram and you can see here we've got our camera and then what we can do is move this slider back and forth to determine what is near or far and you can see that obviously in our viewport. Now something to notice uh, we have red that's kind of closer to us. Our uh, Z depth pass is actually inverted right now. So you can say, is white far or is white near you? So I can just flip flop that and say that white is in fact near us. And now our blue line is, is closer to the camera. And you can see over here as I rock this back and forth, what I'm adjusting here is this focus plane. So I can do that right in the depth o gram UI, or I can do that over here. I also have the ability to offset or bias what, where the focal point is compared to the near and far place, uh, planes. And I can also adjust the range of this. So this is like adjusting the f-stop of my camera. And I'll just leave that kind of near the defaults. Then what I can do is I really love this z-plot. What this allows you to do is actually just click and drag on your, on your uh, image. And you'll notice down in the depth of gram down there, there's a little gray line kind of popping back and forth. So the workflow that I like to do here is set up an initial point of focus, and I'll just kind of get it over there so it's right on the center of our character. And then I intentionally blur this way too much. I'm going to do a really dramatic blur so that you can see as I move this around, you know, here's our character very out of focus. If I move this far away, our character is going to be out of focus uh, up close and in focus far away. So I can start to set this up and say, Let's do an extreme blur and then sort of rock that value back toward the end of, of the process. So here I could say at the first frame, that's going to be good. And let's just kind of jump through and step through maybe every 50 frames or so. I can do a Z plot on our character and it's basically just picking what do I want to be in focus. Maybe I want the back of the gun to be in focus right here. And as I drag around here, I'm watching that little gray line pop around in our depth o gram down there. And then at this frame, I could just very easily keyframe that value right to there with our auto key um, button enabled. So once again, I'll go out forward in time, Z plot something on our character, maybe right there, and just bring this value back a little bit. Jump ahead forward in time, and you get the idea. Now I want maybe our character's face to be in focus and sort of a depth of shallow depth of field in the foreground. Moving forward here, let's Z plot maybe, uh, I want it to be in focus real up close here. And then lastly, let's get to our ending frame way down here in Z plot right on our character's nose. Whoops, I wasn't paying attention where that was in our depth o gram. There we there it is. So now we've got our depth of field. It's, we've got a nice animated depth of field value. And if I go back to our first frame, now we can adjust the quantity of the blur and to a little bit more to our liking, a little bit more, a little bit less, and so on. So here we've got this nice depth of field effect. And once again, because this is a desktop tool, I can load and save these values at any time. And then what I could basically do is just process this back out to the desktop to get our rendered version of our uncompressed depth of field. So once again, you're working with a completely lossless workflow. And then going back out to the desktop, you're going to have a rendered result with that depth of field. Another feature that I'll show you uh, new to this subscription advantage drop is uh, in Flame Effects 2 is called Matchbox. Now Matchbox has several different input types and in this particular case I'm just going to use a two input Matchbox and I'm going to just say I want our foreground or the front and then our secondary input once again will be the Z depth pass and now what Matchbox is doing is asking me to load in some settings here and if for example if I just loaded a warp setting you can see that the effect is you know warping our image around a little bit that's not the effect that I'm going to be wa wanting to do here for 3D, but you can see here that there's all these different shader types. And I've got things like additive, ripples. Uh, let's just take a look at ripples. Obviously, there's a, you know our wonderful ripple effect and so on. But what we want to do in this case is actually Z-rays or Z-depth based rays. So here you can see 
as I uh, pick once again I can just drag around in my image and you can see that we're getting these great volumetric effects on our character and this is something that we could have obviously done in our 3D render but it's going to take significantly longer as a 3D process and so these, these kinds of effects that you can do depth of field uh, volumetric rays and so on are going to be really nice to uh, optionally do in your compositing and or editing environment as we are here in smoke so once again I could just say uh, let's you know increase maybe our lens effect uh, let's change the color of this uh, effect right here and actually pick our sky I'm just gonna hold down control and sample those colors and maybe I want a slightly more yellow version of that and a little bit more saturated so that's gonna be the color of our rays and I can really just dial that up and down and again you can see I'm just doing this in real time all in context within the you know the primary render and I could just make an extreme version of this and then say let's with auto key on let's animate this so I can just pick where do I want this flare to be and then just jump through my animation and once again just kinda of drag this effect out and determine where and how much I want this sort of flaring or these uh, volumetric rays within our particular animation so that's going to do it for me. Uh, I really hope if you're coming to SIGGRAPH, you drop by the booth. Uh, definitely want you to check out all the blogs. My blog is going to be up as it is right now on the area. And with that, I'll exit out. And I do want to thank you for your time. I look forward to the parties, the SIGGRAPH events. And uh, thanks very much.